so much for tuning in tonight to Wingspan of Arts Industry Insights panel event. We are so, so excited to have you because this is a part of our 20th anniversary celebration. Woo! Wingspan has been around for 20 years and we are so excited to celebrate. And so thank you for being here tonight. This event is free. So if you're like, hey, I have a friend who's not doing anything tonight, feel free to send them the link and tell them to watch along with you because it's gonna be a lot of fun. That said, if you would like to make a donation to Wingspan of Arts, there is a link either in the comments if you're watching on Facebook or right below your little video screen if you're watching on our website. Feel free to make a donation. All donations are tax deductible and we would love, love, love your support. And uh, so yeah, thank you. Uh, a couple notes before we start. Uh, Wingspan Arts is an arts education nonprofit. I'm not sure if you knew that. If this is your first time at a Wingspan event, thank you for tuning in. If you did know that, then you know that we have three areas of programming. We have uh, after school programming, we have in school programming, and our wonderful summer theater conservatory. We are currently raising money for our summer theater conservatory program because it is completely tuition free for all participants. We completely remove the financial barrier for everyone. And so if you want to be a part of that impact, you can make a donation today. Uh, we are going to be running our summer program in person this summer. So that's very, very exciting. Anyway, I'm sure you don't want to hear me talk. You want to hear our panelists talk. So I'm going to introduce everyone on our wonderful team for the evening. And first up is my very, very good friend, Frank Villella. You might recognize Frank Villella from On Stage with Spectrum News New York One. You might recognize him from his plentiful interviews with the most famed of actors of the stage and screen, including Lin-Manuel Miranda, Bernadette Peters, Tom Hanks, Elton John, Liza Minnelli, Lady Gaga, Tony Kushner, to name a few. Those were just some. I know Bette Midler. You know, there are, uh, there are so many others. Frank has basically interviewed everyone. Um, Frank is also a, a dear, dear, long-term friend of mine and my sister's, and he's known me since I was 13 years old, so that's really fun. So let's say hi to Frank, and thank you, Frank, for moderating this event tonight and, and for joining us. We are so, so happy to have you. Thanks for having me, Megan. Happy, <laughs> happy, happy to be here. <laughs> Yay! So let's let's jump right in. I'm going to introduce. We have five incredible panelists with us tonight, and uh, first up is somebody who was in Hamilton for three years as John Lawrence and Philip, uh, you know, the the one who died for him, uh, <laughs> Anthony Lee Medina, who also has been on plenty of screen and television roles but you can see him this fall in the Apple TV series, Truth Be Told, opposite Octavia Spencer, Kate Hudson, and Micaiah Pfeiffer. Please welcome Anthony Lee Medina. Hi guys. Hi Anthony. Hi. Fun fact, Anthony and I went to school together for a brief time. I'm gonna give a fun fact for each person as they hop on, <laughs> just cause why not? And then we'll let them have the real conversation. Thanks Anthony for being here. Next up, we have maybe one of my favorite people to follow on Instagram, which is weird because I haven't said that to her face yet. Um, but Lauren Zacharin has been involved in almost anything you can think of. She is currently in Harry Potter and the Curse of Child in San Francisco, but she's been on Broadway in Great Comet and Rock of Ages. She's been on tour in Grease, Legally Blonde. She was in Cool Intentions off Broadway. And of course, we can't not talk about MTV's for Elle Wood. Uh, so let's welcome Lauren Zachrin, who, um, honestly, Lauren, every video that you post of you singing on your Instagram just makes me so happy. And uh, I just, you're amazing. So. That's very kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being here. And I'm sorry to fan girls over you. <laughs> Next up, we have a Wingspan Conservatory alum. You will
Annalise. <laughs> Yay. Uh, <laughs> next up, we have another member of the hashtag wing fam. That's what we call our, uh, our wingspan arts community. Brian Michael Smith was a wingspan teaching artist for like eight years. Except now you can see him on TV as a series regular in 911 Lone Star. He was also in Ava DuVernay's Queen Sugar and a number of other incredible roles. And he has become an incredible advocate for trans, represent trans representation in television and film. My Brian Michael Smith, thank you so much for joining us and returning to Wingspan. We are so, so happy to have you. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. Amazing. Yay. And last but most certainly not least, we have Mark Bruni, who you may know as the uh, Tony Award winning director of Beautiful, uh, the Carol King musical. Um, and he has directed a number of other things. But most importantly, Mark Bruni is a long term supporter of Wingspan Arts. He's on our advisory board, and he's done many workshops with our students. And so I just want to highlight that as, like, really my career favorite for Mark Rooney because he's just such a good friend to us. So thank you, Mark, for, for joining us tonight. Thanks. Yay. Happy to be here. I don't have a Tony, though. Oh, I'm sorry, but Jesse, it was a Tony Award Jesse winning Mueller musical. Jesse Mueller has a Tony. Mm -hmm. Jesse Mueller got a Tony. But, but you know what? You got a Tony in my in my. <laughs> in my head but yes it's a tony award winning musical and they wouldn't have gotten tony's without your director so let's mm -hmm. let's own who, who we are mm -hmm. um and if anyone disagrees with me about that i'm sorry to be offensive i just want to really support mark because i made that mistake um <laughs> but mark you're amazing and thank you so much for being here um i'm gonna now stop talking and i'm gonna pass it over to frank thank you again for participating in this conversation and let's get started Megan, thank you so much, and congratulations on everything you guys do at Wingspan. Truly, 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 arts education is essential. It's just as essential as math, science, and English. We need it. I'm a product of it. We're all a product of it. So um, yay, arts education. All right, to my incredible panel, I want to start with a blanket question that we're going to learn. I'll have you kick off. What is your earliest memory of performing or wanting to perform? Lauren, we'll start with you. All right, to my earliest memory, I was in dance school as a really young kid. I didn't continue as I got older, but um, yeah, I started um, dancing when I was three, and, I'm, and I had no idea that this was like something I was going to do long term, but I did love doing it, and I definitely liked it. The attention on stage and do my own choreography, yeah, <laughs> just step out of line. So uh, that's the earliest memory that I have, even though um, it didn't really ignite before I was much older. Anthony, how about you? Um, I'm kind of like Lauren as far as the ignition of it. Uh, I probably, my first memory is doing a self produced production of The Grinch at my elementary school where I was Cindy Lou Who's dad and about a foot and a half shorter than Cindy Lou. Um, and, but it didn't spark until probably high school. High school was the full switch into this is what I want to do. How about you, Brian? Um, my earliest memory of performing before even like on stage, my mom and her sisters um, all lived together for a while. My cousins and I were kind of raised like siblings. And there was many an evening and afternoon when uh, my aunts would have us like come into the room and like do the tell the story and, and do the thing. So there was a lot of like entertaining within the family, and I just loved like making everybody laugh. You know, uh, you know, in, imitating people that we had like encountered during the day or like recounting the story. But uh, like the first time, like I, I really remember like being on stage and like oh I love this was I was in fifth grade. It was one of those like self-produced the, the stu students make the story like nonsensical uh, plays, and I just remember like how awesome it was that I, I made up this character, I went on stage, I said this is who I was, and everybody on stage like went along with it. Like, I, was, I love this, this is so powerful, you know? And it just, it just stayed with me. Annalise. I think, I think my earliest memory is probably when, during family get-togethers as well, I would force my cousins to do like, someone with the dad, I was the mom, someone with the 
kid and we would put on this whole like house show and we would sing the Three's Company theme song as like the intro to our song. But then it's so crazy because that was all, I, I loved doing that, but then when my mom would put me on stage like for choir in elementary school or doing any kind of programs, I looked like I hated it. I was like so scared, I was like, I don't wanna do this. And then it wasn't until I started middle school going wingspan, you know, doing high school um, productions and really, I guess, studying the craft a little more that I realized that I loved it because at first it looked like I wanted to be anywhere else but there. Oh. And Mark, <laughs> Mark, as a director, when did you know that, like, okay, well, I was, I, was sort of, I was sort of a performer as a kid as well um, before I kind of uh, veered off into directing and, and I, my earliest memory is very much uh, similar to uh, to everyone else of, of putting on shows in our living room. My sister and I put on a yearly Christmas show for our family, which turned into a mini tour because we would do it at my grandmother's house and then we would do it at my, my parents, uh, my house, for, uh, for, the, for some guests and friends that would come like a couple of days after Christmas. So we would have some notes in between to be able to, uh, you know, adjust things that didn't go so well from the grandmother performance. And, you know, have, uh, we, workshopping it, workshopping it, previews. I love that. I love that. Everyone remembers their first, you know, the, the, the first time they, they, they experience something in the theater and, you know, the, the, the alarm goes off, the bug, you're bitten by the bug, and there you go, from, you go from there. For me, it was coming to New York City as a kid, walking down 44th Street and going right into the Majestic Theater shortly after the Phantom of the Opera opened on Broadway. It was the hottest show in town. And I will never forget, like, being in New York on Broadway and just experiencing that show. What was that show for for you guys? Anthony. Um, my, so technically the first show I saw was Oklahoma, but I fell asleep probably <laughs> middle of Act 1 and then woke up at the end. Um, but I saw Wicked um, with Shoshana Bean and Megan Hilty, and I had never heard someone sing like that in my life. She, the two of them, but Shoshana specifically. It was the first time I heard someone sing and sound like a pop singer on Broadway, and that's why I didn't know I could do that until basically seeing her. Um, Wicked, hands down, yeah. Lauren. I can't remember like the first theater experience I had because I know there were like field trips and school, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, the first show I saw in New York City was Legally Blonde the Musical, and that is the first professional job I also had. Um, um, but then I also saw Wicked on tour. It came through Detroit, and that was another one where I was like, I have to be in this. And, uh, yeah, those were two days. Emily. It was definitely Phantom of the Opera for me. Um, I remember, I had seen a couple, I think I was like 12, but I had seen a few Broadway shows before then, but Phantom of the Opera, I went for one of my classmates' birthdays. We all went and we all had little t-shirts on that said Phantom of the Opera, 12th birthday, all this thing. Um, but that was like the first show that, it was just epic. It was epic, like when the chandelier comes into the audience and just the voices and it was everything for me. That was definitely the moment. How about you, Mark? Well, the first show that I saw was Cats, and I remember vividly going to an IHOP beforehand, and my dad had checked out the book of T.S. Eliot poems out of the college library where he worked, and we uh, we read the poems together before going to see Cats, which was which was really meaningful. And uh, but the show that definitely sticks in my mind as the one that uh, that really kind of gobsmacked me about what what the theater could be and what musical comedy could be specifically was the '92 revival of Guys and Dolls, um, oh, wow. with Nathan Lane and Faith Prince, which I'd gone on a high school band trip to go see, and uh, and just thought that that was just incredibly, it was, it was just, uh, had so much energy and life and, uh, and, and color and, and I was, I was just so overwhelmingly um, obstinate by that. How about you, Brian? I grew up in uh, Michigan and so I, I, I didn't see too much um, like big Broadway productions and stuff until I moved to New York in like uh, 2008. But I do remember, I think I was in a middle school and one of the community theaters had this really well done 
production of this like Greek mythology play. I was like Persephone, and I mean, like I'd never seen a stage that well, like like that that well of a well produced like play. And I really felt like I had like went somewhere like on this journey. And I was like, I only really experienced that in the movie. So to like really experience that in a with like people on the stage, like right there, when I can feel them breathing, I was like, that is awesome, you know. And then uh, when I moved to New York, um, I saw a couple of. Uh, of plays, but one that really stuck me was the first time I saw uh, the, my first rock opera, um, Jesus Christ Superstar, and I'm just like, what is going on? It was awesome. I, I, again, it, like, it just showed me just how much, just when I think I know what you can do on stage, like how much further it can go, you know? All right, give it some Angela Wood Weber some love in this chat. I like it, I like it. Kat Spanham and Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, in the spirit of arts education, was there a teacher or director um, who really influenced you in your life? And, and if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about that. How about you, Mark? We'll start with you. Yeah, I went to public school in New Jersey, in Ridgewood, New Jersey, that had a, a, an extraordinary arts program that were actually, there were four teachers that, uh, that co-ran this program that, that produced six shows during the, during the school year and three shows in the summer. So it, there was amazing opportunities for, um, for like about 150 students every year to be able to be involved in, um, in this arts program. They would do a fall play, two spring plays, a spring musical, and, um, uh, and then in the summer, two musicals and a play. So it was, it, it, there, were, there were all of these incredible opportunities. And, um, and I think that the, the, the taste of these teachers um, really geared towards Sondheim. Uh, so uh, we, we actually did um, a, a production of the Sweeney Todd in my junior year of high school, which at the time was still at a time when like not a lot of high schools were doing that. There are a lot of high schools. Very advanced high school. By, 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 by Verdi or, or, uh, or, or Greece or something of that, um, of that ilk at the time. Um, so, uh, so I think, you know, being, being uh, introduced to the, uh, that kind of sophisticated material at an early age was, um, was very uh, important. Mark, who were you? I was Anthony. I was Anthony right. Hope, the, the, the hopeful sailor. The, 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 the young leading man. Yes, yes, that was, that was, that was that. How about you, Lauren? Oh man, um, so one sticks out so specifically for me. She has the most Disney princess name you've ever heard. Her name is Jocelyn Sweetapple. <laughs> and um, I didn't get into theater or singing until like really late in high school. And I got linked up with um, this voice teacher. And you know, she's not much older than me now. Um, but at the time, she was like a beacon of guidance. I was such, I got in a lot of trouble in high school. I was a bad kid um, and I met this woman who just saw something like and really passionately believed in me like she dropped everything and was like I'm driving you to this competition I'm driving you to New York I'm gonna help you figure out what school you want to go to like she saw something in me that I didn't see in myself and she is the number one reason that I moved in this direction I never ever would have thought it was possible if she didn't tell me that I had to do that how about you Brian Um, early on, um, in high school, it was actually my English teacher. I ended up having, um, uh, for three years, because she was the English teacher for the Accelerator program. And then, uh, when I was a senior, we had the Humanities program, and she co-taught it with four other, uh, teachers. And, like, kind of similar to, to Lauren, where she just, she saw something in me that she always nurtured, no matter how kind of off the rails I would get. She was really a teacher who believed in corralling instead of controlling. So even if I, you know, had the impulse to, like, go stand in the front of the class and, like, you know, be talking, you know, she'd be like, well, if you're going to be doing that, how about you read X, Y, and Z and, like, let me, like, go to town. And so just always kind of pushed me in that direction, always fed me more things, like, that were, like, clued into my interests and instead of, like, you know, kind of, you know, trying to tell me, like, you know, stop, don't do this, whatever, you know, she was like, let me, there's a, there's a channel for you, there's a place for you to have something if you need to. You know, there's some rules, but you you know you got to learn how to work within them and then how to work around them. She sort of put that in me early on, and then when it actually came down to performance, I feel like the first real guidance I had in how to how to craft a performance came from working with Terry Knickerbocker in uh, in New York. He was my you know, my teacher. And I felt like I had like 
missed the, the ball or like missed the boat on like, you know, being able to perform. I was in my like mid twenties at this point. So I'm like, ah, you know, if you're gonna be an actor, you're already gonna be real at least I can learn a little something. But he really showed me like what it takes to, to craft a full performance and like, you know, how it's a marathon and not a sprint and it takes twenty years to master something. So I felt like, okay, you know, I, I can really put in the work and I have time to, to mature as an as an artist as opposed to somebody who's trying to, you know, get notches in the career belt. It was like, what do you wanna say with what you work on, you know. So that was that was really eye opening for me. Twenty years to master. How about you? Um, I was really fortunate. I grew up in Westchester County, New York, and uh, the arts are really celebrated there. I had a lot of great teachers throughout my time living in Westchester County. Um, but there is one teacher that truly. I was also a bad kid. I was a mess. I had a lot of energy. I could not be controlled and. When someone put me on stage in my high school production of Fame, um, it was the first time I calmed down and I was focused. And a lot of the teachers, the guidance counselors, kind of caught wind of that. And everyone kind of just forced me into it on a nonstop basis. And specifically, uh, uh, my choir teacher, Annette Vaccaro, she, um, she would call me out without question. Like, she would put me in my place in front of everyone because she knew I could take it. And then after class would have me like seeing arias at like 15, 16 years old, uh, just to make sure that I knew that I, I could do this. Um, I would also like do things like pull the national anthem for me, like you can't sing it because you were bad in class today. So she kind of like set the boundaries of how the arts were gonna work for me and encouraged me the entire way. She was the, one of the first people that came to see me in Hamilton, um, cried the entire time, I could hear her crying. Um, yeah, she was, she was, it's, it's still to this day one of the most, like, influential teachers in my life. So, she kind of, like, always said the value Yeah, um, a lot like everybody else, Jennifer Jenkins, oh, this is, like, an obvious choice for me, because she, um, she was my choir teacher in middle school. Um, I had never studied any kind of singing, anything like that, and she saw something in me when we were singing in class and was like, oh, I think I think she's got something. And so she approached my mom about it and said, I would like to give your daughter voice lessons. At the time, it wasn't something that we could really swing. We were like, I don't know if this is, I was going to private school, you know, I was, we didn't know if we were gonna be able to do that. And she said, we're gonna make it work. And she just, she took me under her wing from when I was 11 until I was 18. She coached me college auditions. She's the reason I went to my college, Montclair State University. Um, she's the reason I found my voice. I owe everything to her. And ever since then, I've met so many wonderful people along the way. Of course, Jessica, Marissa from Wingspan. Um, you know, my English teacher in high school, she's somebody who it encouraged me to to express my feelings through writing and because of her I started playwriting and stuff like that and you know, teachers are everything so it, there's so many there's so many more as well that I'm not mentioning <laughs> well and always you, you mentioned Wingspan just talk about specifically how Wingspan has shaped your career in your life as yeah you know I think coming from yeah you know, I was a child I was I was quiet. I, you know, I had, I had a behavioral issues as well in, in elementary school, and um, it was like pulling teeth to get me to say anything and to get me to express myself in any way. So when I started Wingspan, I think I was about thirteen or fourteen. I, I, like I said before, I was so afraid of being on stage. I was so afraid of talking to the other kids. I had never been in an environment where other children and other teens, other people shared the same passion as I did as I started to realize I love doing this I love music I love art I love writing and singing and, and everything um, it was the first place where I felt it was okay to express myself in a creative light and because of them not only in my career or in the creative art because of them I found my my, my footing and my ground as a person to be able to stand up for myself and to be able to talk for myself um, and it was, and, and there's something about you know a teacher being empathetic towards you and understanding you and, and, and willing to listen to you all the time. And I feel like Wingspan is everything and more with that. Um, and I owe, I owe them everything. And 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 at least I do have to ask: you are going to be a part of the Steven Spielberg uh, remake of West Side Story? 
the trailer came out not too long ago and it looks incredible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> give us give us some give us some tea on uh, on West Side. Oh my God! Honestly, that was something that I had never thought was going to happen. Um, it was, of course, my favorite movie in that. Being Puerto Rican as well, it was our favorite movie in growing up in the house. My sister was a dancer, so we always watched it. Um, I saw the Broadway show. How long was it? Like, like 10 years ago? The, the Broadway revival? Was it 10 years ago? I don't know. But, 2009, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was my favorite musical, my favorite movie growing up. But I had never thought that they were going to remake it. I, mean, I was just like, that's not going to I don't know. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to be a part of that. Um, and so when I got the opportunity to audition, I was like, what? You know, I think a lot of the time I'm like, I feel like the whole process, I was like, this is not going to be for me. This is fun. Every time I went into the audition, I was like, yeah, this is fun. And so then when I ended up getting the news that I was going to be a part of it, it was like, I don't think I'll really believe it until I see it. But I feel like we were all kind of in this, this alternate universe filming that. We were like, is this real? But it was it was a dream, and it couldn't have been in better hands, in my opinion. Um, and just to be true to to the um, the culture, you know, of Puerto Rico, and, and just, I, I don't, I, it was a dream come true. And so I'm, I'm really, I'm really excited to see it. Yeah. And, and it's a tad, um, you know, tweaked, if you will. I, I remember running into Tony Fishner this summer, I guess, you guys were filming, and he was, you know, tweaking the script, and there are some timely themes, if you will, that are presented in this new version of this thing. Without giving yeah. anything away. Yeah, I mean, well, I think the most important thing that happened is that they, you know, there are rewrites, but they, they incorporated the Spanish language into the film, um, which I think is going to it's going to change the, the, the view that we're seeing this in from the from the original. The original is, of course, amazing, but um, adding the Spanish language to it, um, I think is gonna just bring it to another level. Um, but also, it's, you know, it's gangs, it's crime, it's, it's a lot, it's kind of mirroring, you know, what it means to be American. And so I think that's what we're going through a lot now during the pandemic and during these last two years, you know, what it is to be American in America. Um, and so, you know, without giving anything away, I just think it's, it's so relevant right now. It's amazing. Um, keeping, or going back to the theme of Wingspan, Brian, you were a teaching artist uh, at Wingspan. What's your fondest memory of presenting your gifts to students at You know, it's interesting. Um, my finest memories are more of like the gifts that were presented to me by the young people. You know, I, you know, show up and, uh, you know, I did a filmmaking class with them. I did a drama class. I did a Lego creation. But what I really enjoyed about the filmmaking class was the way that I um, set it up with after sort of helping them understand like how what they watch, they can like create their own version of that um, and then letting them come up with what their story was going to be and watch them go from like, you know, kind of scattered wild children to like a filmmaking team was, you know, an incredible thing to see. And then the pride in which they shared their work when their when their family would come to like watch their films and the family and their friends and the rest of the people in the program would like watch what they came up with. And like, you know, that was my story. And, you know, watching kids who had a hard time, you know, speaking and expressing themselves, you know, like having their peers like pick them to be the lead in their in their movie and you know watching them watch their work and you know accept you know the the, the applause for like what what they've done or just seeing their idea like if someone you know maybe they didn't want to, to act in something but you know they really had a strong idea and then watching them find their voice really advocate for why they wanted this scene to be this way or like this moment to be here the character like that and then you know um that efficacy where they would like share it with their peers, their peers would get on board, and then the final product would, would be in the film, and like that quiet kid, like you know, celebrating. I mean, there's there's a lot of moments like that like, working with with, uh, with the young people, and just kind of seeing them come from either a place of um, giving too much and learning how to work with others, or being just kind of like a, a wallflower and seeing you know people appreciate what they have to offer. It's something I carry with me every day. I love that. 
Lauren and Anthony, you know, you guys are will forever be associated with two shows that are kind of the intro to a lot of young fathers. Anthony with Hamilton, Lauren with Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Um, how does that make you feel as artists to you know that you are presenting, you know, work on stage, knowing that there is that young guy or gal in the audience, you know, watching the show, taking it in and saying to, to themselves, you know what, I'm here. I'm not leaving. This is now my world. I'm going to be a part of this world. So how does that make you feel? Yeah. I'm going to see you shaking your head. Man, I grew up with Harry Potter and I was so into it. So I'm that kid, you know? I, um, you know, started reading the books when I came out so I was really young and was really absorbed into that world and the magic of it. And now I get to be a part of sharing that story in a way that's so tangible. So it's not just a kid reading a book or or watching a movie and knowing that it's CGI or it's computer. It's like happening live right in front of them. And um, you hear kids shouting and gasping and crying at different moments in the show. And it just feels like, I remember going to, um, <laughs> it's really close, I'm not really theater related, but going to Disney World when I was a kid. And my mom had like a little video of me crying because I was meeting Minnie Mouse. Like I believed it so much. I was just so in the magic, and I just think that is so important to have kids believe and wonder what's possible in this real. Like we have this like set of rules that we think that the world follows, and everything exists in this dimension. And I think um, for children, they're still just so in the awe of it all, and they still believe. That, that is Lord Voldemort walking through the aisle. And I think it's so important to keep that alive as long as possible. I feel honored totally. to be part of the story. Totally, Anthony. How about you? Any great stage shore memories of you know meeting young folks at the end of the show? Oh, tons. We, um, at Hamilton, they do something called Edge of Ham on uh, Wednesday matinees are for students. So we get an entire house of just students. And yeah. you get to watch them see themselves, for the, especially as a, as a man of color on stage. I didn't get to see that a lot when I was a kid growing up and, and seeing in television or in theater for that matter. Um, and to be one of the first representations that some of these kids get to see and that is the spark that it's possible that because I've stepped on stage, they now can see themselves. It's amazing. And I mean, <laughs> after those shows, we'll walk out the stage door. We don't do signing after those shows usually. And some, and cause the kids have to go back to school the kids will find you on the streets and they'll chase you down because they're just so enamored with what just happened. And yeah, it, the impact we get to have on kids on a regular basis is yeah. um, You know, there are so many jobs or, or so many opportunities, I should say, if you want to be in the theater. You know, case in point, myself, I came to New York like many wanted to be an actor, studied at Fordham University at Lincoln Center, and realized very early on that, you know, I did not have what it takes to pursue a career on the stage or on screen, so I found my way of, you know, being an arts journalist and entertainment journalist, and that is my way of being part of this incredible community, uh, both here in New York and really around the country and around the world. Mark, you, sounds like the same thing, you know, you had early aspirations of, you know, performing from your home, you know, going on those mini tours, um, workshopping it at your grandparents' house and doing it at home. Um, and then you are now one of um, our great Broadway directors. Just talk to me about, you know, the opportunities for folks who want to be a part of it all, as they say in the show, title of the show, but, you know, being a part of it all doesn't just mean being stage. Well, th thank you. You're very kind, Frank. Um, but uh, I, I think uh, part of what I think is so wonderful about arts education and what I feel uh, uh, that it even even ties back into the West Side Story about finding your tribe, finding your group. And I think that the theater and the, um, the ability to connect to other kids who have similar interests and to be collaborating with them on, on something that you are going to produce together, and that you're going to make a hat, and you're going to you're going to make um, you know something that that was never there before. Um, that's that's something that's so critical and so important to be able to be related to any kind of um, other career, whether you, whether you're going to go and, and be an actor or you're going to go and, and uh, part of what I love about directing 
Um, and the reason that I transitioned from um, being, an, being an actor to, to being a director is because I just enjoyed the collaboration and, the, and looking at the big picture and being able to tell a story from multiple points of view. And, um, and, and, that's, and that's true whether you're in the arts or whether you're um, you know, giving a presentation uh, in, a, in a business situation. You know, I think, I think the, the, the basis of arts education is about engendering empathy. It's about telling stories in order to, um, to be able to look at, some, look at the world through somebody else's eyes and to, uh, to be able to uh, see a, a story uh, that, that, can, that you can take some, some of what's going on and relate it to your own life. And, 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 and certainly, like the, the, it's, it's wonderful to be able to have somebody that you, you, see, you see yourself in uh, on stage, but also the, in terms of um, the, uh, the, the, the story that's being told, um, oftentimes there's, there's, a, there's a way that that can kind of the world in, um, in how to deal with the, the various problems of, uh, of being human and being and growing up. And, um, and I, I think that those, those, those lessons are so valuable and so um, uh, transportable to, um, to kind of whatever, uh, what, whatever path you choose to take and, or that the, um, uh, the world decides to take for you as you, as you sort of find yourself on, on, on the road. So true, so true. Um, this goes without saying, it's been a challenging time for every single person in the moment in arts and entertainment this past year. It's a major challenging time. What's been the biggest challenge for you during this worldwide pandemic? Um, I, I moved to Los Angeles a month before this all started. So I didn't have uh, a community set up yet for me out here. Um, and it really took a lot of time just to figure out what the shift could be to allow myself some form of income. Um, and I was fortunate, a friend of mine from another production, Hamilton, uh, hit me up and said that they were looking for someone to read audiobooks. And I became an audio, that was like once a week I was in a closet for 10 hours reading a book. Um, and it was just, figuring out how this thing that we do on stage can translate into just reading. And it actually worked out really beautifully. Um, as actors, uh, we probably all have told stories and had to play 15 different characters at the same time. And that's kind of been the process of that. Um, but to be honest, the hardest thing was just being locked inside in an entirely new place without my community. Because the, the theater world is my community. New York is my community. I'm born and bred. so. How do you want? This is such a hard question. <laughs> What's been the hardest thing? Um, I don't think that I can uh, pinpoint that because the challenges have been uh, numerous. But when the pandemic happened, when the shutdown happened, as you mentioned, I was in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child in San Francisco. Um, I had no idea what was going on, so I broke my lease. And, and within 48 hours of them shutting the show down, like broke the lease, picked everything up, moved, put everything in a storage unit, moved back to New York. Since then, I've moved to Arizona. Uh, I spent a month on the road. I'm now in Los Angeles in this um, furnished uh, sublet. Um, just the uncertainty of it all and trying to re, um, what's the right word? Heal my identity. Yeah, um, rediscover what my identity is without theater, without this thing that I have used to define my worth, which is not how you should be or your career, um, but it's been really challenging. There were some really tough months at the beginning, and then I'll say that the last four months of my life have been the happiest and healthiest and best. So um, while there was so much challenge with all this moving around and trying to figure out who I was and what I was going to do for money and uh, what I had to offer, it led to ex extremely life-changing self-discovery and healing. So, you know, of course, I don't want to say the gift of the pandemic, but it is one of the gifts of the pandemic like that I was able to turn and look at myself. So. How about you, Brian? Well, kind of similar. My life was 
in the process of a very dramatic change. Like after years of the hustle and the grind of doing theater and uh, paid work and unpaid work and, you know, being a professional job seeker for about, you know, 11 years, uh, <laughs> I, I started working on this TV show and things were great. And then the pen, like we had just finished filming and um, my wife we were like, okay, well, if we get a second season and we're going to, you know, move over the summer because she is, you know, born and bred in New York and she works, at, you know, for the DOE and, you know, something that was in the cards and, okay, looks like we're going to do this, you know, towards the end of the summer and we finished filming in February and then the world just went crazy and we were on, you know, it went at, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was like, we're going to do this for two weeks, lockdown, no flights, nothing for two weeks and then once we get it under control, once we flatten the curve. You know, then, uh, you know, things went, and then, like, you know, okay, two weeks turned into a month, and a month turned into two months, and it was like, okay, this is very difficult, and we are on two separate coasts, and that is not making it any easier. So, how are we going to make this work? So, that was some of the most challenging um, moments for me for the pandemic is not knowing does it make sense to go back to New York and try to ride things out in New York? Are we going to pick the show back up because everything's shutting down? So, you know, there was a lot, but that uncertainty was very difficult to, uh, to deal with and to navigate. And then, you know, the feeling of being uprooted from everything that you had used to define yourself and being so far away from everything that kind of helped you understand the context of who you are was like just gone. And so for, for months, I'm just sitting there like, well, what is, who the hell am I? Or who the heck am I? And what, what am I going to do now? What do I want to do? And who are we? And how are we going to be together? And, how are we making these decisions? So there was a lot of um, help you understand the reflection, mining of, of emotions, learning how to talk about things, you know, that I, that I went through, uh, and me and my wife went through with our relationship and, you know, just trying to make things work as the world slowly got together, plus the anxiety of not knowing if any people that I know and love were going to get very sick, you know, and maybe pass away and people did get sick and pass away. So there was, it was a lot uh, during the pandemic, but there was light in the horizon Towards the you know summer when we learned that the show is going to come back and it's just working out the logistics and then moving forward with that new understanding of what my actual values are now, what are my priorities now, and what do I want to create moving forward, um, given how much I can control in the world and how much I can't, you know, and like just coming to accept what I can and can't control, and then what am I going to do with the things that I can. So that was that was my gift of the pandemic is just like recognizing where my power lies and where my value really lies, and then being feeling like I, I have a choice in, in what I'm going to do with it, as opposed to just being blown about by the winds of pandemics and politics. That was my gift. What do you mean? Well, when the pandemic hit, I was in the we had just finished the third week of rehearsal on an off Broadway musical called Trevor, and we had gotten to the point where if we had rehearsed one more day, we would have been able to do a run through. So it was just at that stage where you feel like you, you're just on the verge of understanding what the whole thing is gonna look like. And then, um, and then it, uh, it, all, it all kind of um, you know, stopped. And, and that's, a, that's a show that is very much about a very specific time in life. And it's because it's about um, middle school and, about, and it takes place um, with, uh, with the cast of age-appropriate actors who are all in middle school themselves. And so um, that, that, that I think has been much harder on, on all of them who became such a family at that, at that point. Um, and I, I, for, for me, I, you know, I, the, the moving of the goalposts, I think, is the thing that has been the hardest, is that, that not knowing just what the, it, if you can deal with the big scope if you, 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 when you know something, the scope of the problem, you can kind of uh, reconcile your, your mind to it. Um, but when it, when it just seems like it's constantly adding and moving the goalposts, that's, that's hard. And also, I'm, you know, as a, as a director, it's not something you can do by yourself in your living room. You know, it, it requires other people, it requires. Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I, I was fortunately able to adapt and did a web series um, that uh, was filmed individually in people's apartments, um, which which was uh, which was great fun, and just to try and kind of come up with something, a new way of working. Um, but um, you know, you, you, everyone everyone needed to adapt. Everybody needed to kind of create, find find the parts of themselves that they didn't know were there, and um, and, and figure out figure out a way to uh, to disassociate um, 
the, the, their, their true selves from their kind of, you know, performative uh, professional selves. Um, and I, there's what was time to be able to kind of dwell on that a little bit. And always. Yeah. Um, for me, I think it was stillness, finding like stillness and being okay with that. You know, all of us are so used to going, 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 going all the time, hustling, hustling, hustling. So the first few months of the pandemic, I struggled a lot with just being home with myself and figuring out who that person is, a lot like everybody else, who that person is without all of that. Um, I was lucky enough, I'm from New York, my family's from New York, so I got to be with my family, which was a huge blessing, and I really don't know what I would have done <laughs> if I had been from somewhere else and, you know, was stuck in New York by myself or something, you know. Um, so I'm very fortunate fortunate with that. But it was also, it was weird because it was such a terrible year for everybody. But at the same time, it was, for me personally, it was a lot of firsts for me, career-wise, personal, personally. And so it was hard to balance that. I had a hard time finding happiness in some of that um, success, I guess. You know, I was like, I'm, I'm excited for this. I'm excited for this opportunity. But I don't, it was a part of me that didn't feel right all the time. Um, and I think it's just, you know, the world was struggling, you know, we were struggling here and, and the community of the arts was struggling. So I think, um, I was, you know, finding a balance of that. Um, and I'm grateful for those first, but also at the same time, it was learning, learning how to be myself without everything, um, arts included. Um, but yeah, I'm, I think it was a lot of self-discovery and I'm grateful for, for the past year, um, at the same time. What do you guys say to the young folks and even some parents who may be watching this thinking, you know what, it was a hard year. The arts community, the performing arts community, and the entertainment community was totally shut down for the most part in terms of theater. You know, should my child pursue this? Or is the young kid watching, should I even pursue this? Is it worth it? Can I do this? What do you guys say to that person? Well, I'll jump in and just say, absolutely, yes. Um, I, I, I just I look back on uh, on what the the arts education that I received gave to me, and I see that everybody else on this on this Zoom call um, has has been has had their lives enriched in such a profound way by the experiences that came through the arts, and to to think that um, that you would deprive. Um, another generation of that because of something that has nothing to do with um, with the actual act of coming together and and to, t to tell stories that's that's something that is inherent in who we are as humans and something that has been a part of human culture since the beginning and so um, uh, so I think that there's there, there's no way to stop that from happening that is going to continue to happen in whatever form and so um, I, I think uh, I, I would I would very much encourage um, it, it also, parents are not going to be able to. Uh, it, when you have the passion, you have to do it. There's no, there's no choice in the matter. Like it, you don't, you don't have the, the ability to say, um, I, I, I'm just okay. I, I tried, but I, I don't think, uh, I, I don't think I'm going to do that. When, it, as, as, as I'm sure, I don't want to speak for everyone, but you know, it's, it is a, it is a difficult road for everybody, and, and everyone has their own. Um, struggles along the way. It's not. It's not an easy thing. Certainly, in the, to, to have a career in the theater, um, but the the passion and the commitment to um, to feeling like you can't do anything else is what um, sustains you through all of that. Um, and and so uh, and and so you you know it. You know it when you see. I mean, I, in, even in the experience that I had with Wingspan, I got the uh, uh, privilege uh, a few weeks ago. I, I was probably a few months ago, actually. Time in COVID just doesn't seem like uh, a thing, um, but um, uh, I, I got to uh, work with some some of the uh, wingspan students on some songs, and and you can just you can just tell in their eyes when they have that passion for for what they're doing, and and you and you go there's no there's no stopping that that's not there's nothing you can say to that kid that is going to stop them from doing this, and um, although many may try, but uh, but I think that. Um, 
you know, it, I, I would I would encourage um, parents to be truthful about what their what their kids are saying to them and and to um, you know allow them to uh, pursue their passions. Sorry for being long with you there. No, no, you're absolutely right. Um, I also want to point out that the industry is going through a major reset, and, and I'm specifically talking about the theater community. And I've seen it. I've been covering. You know this industry now for almost 20 years. I've been there covering it throughout this entire pandemic, and just recently there have been marches, um, kind of signaling, signaling and spotlighting a social movement that is happening, a social justice, justice movement that is happening um, in the community. In your mind, what does the next chapter look like for theater? As artists who have had experience with professional theater. You're in New York. What does the next chapter look like for you? I think it's going to look more representative of the world that we're in right now and how it exists and who's involved. There is a much needed push for equity in theater. And right now, what's, what's awesome is that more people are listening, more people who have been traditional gatekeeper are listening and they're starting to understand that in order for theater and art to survive, for the industry to survive, you, you can't keep being exclusionary. It's not benefiting us as part participants in it, and it's not benefiting the consumers of it, the people who are coming to, to see it, you know? So I think the next chapter is going to look uh, more expansive in, in a lot of ways, especially now that they're recognizing that there are more stories to be told, and that there are people who now have the capacity to do it. And um, if you step out of the way of holding up traditions that aren't uh, helpful to that expansiveness, then everybody benefits from it. You know what I mean? So I, I think everyone started to wake up and recognize that there's an expansiveness happening that's coming from the people who are creators and the people who are uh, consumers of, of theater. Brian, as a real trailblazer in the entertainment community, as a trans performer, you know, one of the things the movement is calling for is more trans representation across the country. You know, that's what you see on stage, what you see on screen, what you see behind the scenes. How is that accomplished? How is that accomplished? By listening to trans people and by creating safe spaces for people to talk about their uh, experiences, to bring their stories into onto the stage, into the room by hiring people who are trans and non-binary uh, to perform, but also, you know, um, they're um, producing plays, having trans producers, just basically stepping out of the way and letting people be who they are. Like, it's not like trans people hadn't been, you know, involved in theater, you know, for the last, you know, hundreds of, of years. They've been involved. It's just there's been this exclusion and there's been this lack of safety. But what we're seeing in the, in the last, you know, 10, 15 years is, um, even just the changing of the language and breakdowns, the changing of the language um, and how we talk about certain people, certain characters have created a sense of safety for more people to be open um, about their experiences and bring that experience to the work. So I think that's how it's been accomplished. And I think that's how it's going to continue to be accomplished by, you know, people sharing their pronouns, whether they're trans or not, by, you know, hiring again people who are trans to write, to produce, to market, you know, all across theater, just being more open to letting people be involved um, and bring that experience into into these places, you know, helps us accomplish this sort of equity across gender expression and identity. Absolutely. We are coming to the close of this amazing conversation, and I want to thank all of you for joining me today. But as we close, we're going to go down the line with some more, and this is something I've asked every single artist I've come in contact with during pandemic, whether it was on air, whether it was on my podcast, um, you know, whether I was writing about it, and this is when Broadway comes back, when the performing arts come back in New York City, in the post this country. What's the smallest thing you were looking forward to? It's the tiniest detail you cannot wait to experience when the theater comes back, and that is as either an audience member or as someone on the stage or behind. Um, at the moment, I don't have any plans to be on stage, but uh, as an audience member, I mean, just the sound of that downbeat at the beginning of an orchestration is like, 
we haven't had that opportunity in a long time and to be in a, in a full audience and experience that because you know those first times are going to be incredible but if I really could I would love to be back in Hamilton just for one show just to like experience what that is going to be like because those audiences are going to be I mean it's going to be overwhelming it's going to be church Brian how about yeah. you both um, this experience when but I'm a, really in the could, in the audience and when I'm on the stage when yeah, it's just so that like collective silence of everyone taking whatever ride it is that, that that that's present on the stage you know when it's just it's just quiet because we're all kind of one where like they are feel everybody's feeling the same thing when they all just kind of drop into that energy and whether it's like a moment of triumph or sadness or like shock or whatever, but everybody like syncs up. I, I love that. Whether I'm in the audience, or whether I'm on the stage, I know they're with me. You know, I, I miss that. I can't wait to have that experience again. I, I, I agree on the downbeat, but I, I'm going to go one beat right before that, which is the cell phone announcement. Uh, just, just the moment right after the cell phone announcement, when you know the show is coming, and there's that anticipation that we're, it's about to start, and, and you can just feel the everyone's excitement gearing up and that when we come back that 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 period is going to be so amazing to just hear people's uh, their revved up enthusiasm that's, that's just been in a boiling pot for so long ready for re ready ready to uh to, to explode and I, I think that's going to be really an incredible thing as an audience member um I haven't bought my ticket yet, um, but my first show back is probably going to be Ain't Too Proud. Um, and for me, I think I'm most excited just to the first final bow, or the first bow, because I just, I, everyone is going to know how much that moment means and how long they've been waiting to, any show, just how long they've been waiting to connect together, to connect with the audience, to connect with each other. And the bow is just like, it, it, I feel like everyone's just going to get washed over with just so many emotions, and um, I'm probably going to be a puddle. So I'm I'm very excited for that. How about you? Oh, um, it's overwhelming to think about the bow and the downbeat. Oh my gosh! I can't. I'm like thinking of the Harry Potter music and stuff. Um, I was going to say the community. Um, of course, we've all missed all different types of communities over um, this shutdown. We've been so isolated, but um, I think just like having some social challenges, like having that built-in family, where no matter what, there is intimacy and there's trust and there's creation together. And you come in and you, you know, say, you know, share what's going on in your life and you support each other and then you go out on stage and you dance and you celebrate. Like having that built-in family and community having dance parties backstage before you warm up for the show, like all of that. Oh God, I miss those people so much. I, I miss them in every show I've ever been in, you know, you learn to love each other. Um, and it's really di different from, you know, my, my husband works in a corporate office. He works at Comedy Central, so he's like in, you know, create a creative field, but it's just so different the way that that dynamic is because there isn't that like intimacy and trust and building together. Um, so really, really, really lucky to have had that for the last 12 years. Incredible. Well, thank you all. It's so good seeing your faces. And I can't wait to see you back, whether it's on screen or on stage. And we'll bring back Megan and Blake. Thank you so much. And thank you, Frank, for, uh, for this lovely conversation. You know, I was watching off screen and I'm not gonna lie, I got teary for a number, like a number of different times. Uh, I'm emotional, but uh, <laughs> thank you all so much for, for sharing your thoughts uh, with us and we appreciate you. And, um, and this was a really great way to celebrate 20 years of Wingspan Arts, but also just your own individual career. So thank you again for taking the time to, to be with us today to celebrate. Um, again, for our viewers, if you'd like to make a tax-deductible donation, you certainly can do that in the comments section or below the screen. Um, but otherwise, just follow us on social media. We have some great things coming up, including screenings of our summer shows from 2009, which, Annalise, you weren't there in 2009. That's before your time.
Oh. Ooh, I think I, I think I was 2009 to 2014. 2013. All right. Well, then you can My see dear. Annalise's debut in our <laughs> screenings this weekend. Um, seven o'clock every night on our on our Facebook Live. We have a different screening from that summer. So. Um, Otherwise, we will just say good night to you all, and and thank you again for for joining us. Oh, thank you.